Good morning. Today is the 17th day of Elul, the 3rd of September, and we're starting the double portion of Nitzavim Vayelech in the book of Deuteronomy. The two portions by themselves are sometimes considered to be too short to be an actual portion. Uh, so they're usually combined. Uh, Nitzavim has 40 verses and Vayelech only has 30. They do sometimes in certain years stand apart, but it doesn't happen very often. Usually they're together with 70 verses altogether, which is, which just in and of itself would make it shorter even than Jethro, which has 72. Um, so they're very short. The only, the only part that's a little long is the first portion, the first reading, and our reading today. The first reading has 28 verses in it, and we're going to look at the very end. Actually, the first reading is almost like another rebuke. If you remember the whole book of Deuteronomy, in a certain sense, is Mo Moses uh, rebuking the people for everything that had gone wrong and, and, and challenge, challenging them about the future. But the first verse starts with, uh, You are all standing today before, God, before Havaya, your God, the leaders of your tribes, your elders, your sheriffs, and every Israelite man. The sages say that the reason he has to say you're all standing is in order to give them strength, because he has just finished with the 98 curses that we read in Kitavo. And so you're all standing uh, is almost like a giving of power to them, to be able to stand after hearing all this. There's another reference in the first verse, which is today. And from Job, from the beginning of the book of Job, we learn that every place that it says today in the Bible, there is a, a hidden allusion or a hidden reference to Rosh Hashanah, to the first day of the year. We learn this from the book of Job, where it says, Vayihi Yom, and the day came to pass, and uh, the angels came before God. It's one of the most mysterious books uh, of the Bible in that sense, because the Bible doesn't mention angels ver very much in the first place. Um, and they came to give a report about what they had seen, and then uh, Satan there, it says actually his name, this Satan character, he comes to God and he tells him about, um, um, and God tells him actually, God opens up and says, have you seen my servant Job? And then the whole, the whole affair begins, but from the word, and the day it, the day came to pass, we learned that this was Rosh Hashanah, the day on which God judges the world. In any case, we want to go to the very, very end of the first reading, which is verse 28. So we're in De Deuteronomy 29:28. <coughs> I'll read it with the uh, commentary here, uh, the Vishnevsky commentary, which includes Rashi and some of the Rebbe's uh, teachings. And he says like this, a second reason why it is necessary for you to enter into this new additional covenant is to make you all officially responsible and liable for one another. Now this was something that we wanted to cover in Kitavo. We didn't get a chance because it was one of the days that I missed. But the co the, there are two types of covenant that were uh, introduced in Kitavo. One is the general covenant between the Jewish people and God. It says altogether in, uh, in the Talmud that there were three such covenants made. This was the third one. And a covenant between the Jews and themselves, the covenant that was to be made in the land of Israel once they entered. And remember with the whole story with the 12 boulders that were taken from place to place, that was meant to set up the covenant between the Jews and themselves. And that covenant is a covenant of liability which means that we are responsible for the conduct of each other. And sometimes people would be punished or suffer the consequences of something that they didn't do, but that rather someone else did. And so there is this mutual responsibility and mutual liability. In any case, as I said above, you will be held collectively accountable if any individual family or tribe strays from God and influences the rest of the community to do likewise. This does not imply, however, that you will be held responsible for others thoughts. Meaning, if someone thinks of idolatry, of worshipping an idol or leaving God, you're not responsible for their thoughts, for they, these are hidden from you. 
you will only be held collectively responsible for words and actions performed by those among you. The hidden things, such as others' thoughts, are for Havaya our God to handle. Only the revealed things, their words and actions, are for us and for our children to handle forever to ensure that we as a nation fulfill all the words of this Torah. Now, this was a long uh, uh, take on a few short words, and the words actually state, Hanistarot vaniglot lanu veneinu adolam. That which is hidden is for Havaya our God, that, that which is revealed is for us and our children eternally. And again, the simple meaning is that we are only liable and responsible for, responsible for one another for those things that we can see, that we know about. However, this verse became the basis of a great deal of the concealed, the Kabbalistic tradition, the concealed dimension of the Torah. And the reason it became such an important verse is because it refers here to there being a hidden dimension and a revealed dimension. How do we understand this? So the simple understanding was that Hanistarot lehavaya elokeinu. That which is hidden is to Havaya our God, and that which is revealed is to us and our children, refers to the two halves of God's four-letter name. So the first two letters, Yud and He, the first half, they are concealed and belong to Havaya as a word. They belong to God as a word. They are godly knowledge. Whereas the last two letters, and that's actually the, the, the last two letters, Vav and He, of God's four-letter name, are the first two letters of the word and the revealed, Vehaniglot. You can look at that word, Vehaniglot, and you see that it begins with Vav and He. So that refers to the last two letters, and they are revealed for us and our children. Now, the truth was that I was going to uh, give three different examples of how we correspond the four letters of God's essential name, Yudke Vavke, the Tetragrammaton, and how we divide it in the middle so that the, first to uh, the, the top two letters are the concealed and the bottom two letters are the revealed. But I don't think we're going to have time for all three. So I'm going to choose one. And I'm cho going to choose one that's the Hasidic one. The most, the most Hasidic of all the explanations. Um, we just saw this right now. He said that thoughts are concealed. Right? Thoughts are concealed. Words and actions are revealed. What do we mean by that? I cannot tell what someone else is thinking. I can only recognize what they say and what they do. And so the concealed re refers to the first two letters of God's name, which includes something and thought, meaning the Yud, the first letter, will be something. We'll, be, we'll see what that is in a moment. And the He corresponds to thought. The bottom two letters are the words and the actions, that which is revealed. What is revealed to me? Meaning if someone only thinks of worshipping an idol, worshipping a false god, that is something that is not in my jurisdiction. I'm not responsible or liable for that because I can't know what someone else is thinking. On the other hand, if they tell me or they actually go and do it and I don't stop them and I don't deter them, then I am liable because I knew about it. So here we have a very basic uh, uh, model of the four letters corresponding to what we call the garments of the soul. The three garments are thought, speech, and action. If they are the garments, then the Yud is the soul itself. Then the Yud represents the soul itself. So, for instance, uh, uh, the fourth chapter of Tanya begins and tells us that the divine soul has three garments. So we have the divine soul corresponding to the Yud, and then the three garments that it has with which it expresses itself, thought, speech, and action. What this means is that one cannot know of the Yud. That's why the Yud is like a tiny letter. It's almost like non-existent. One cannot know one's divine soul directly. We can only know it through the three garments, one of which is concealed to other people, two of which are revealed. So when I look at another person, I can't recognize their divine soul unless I see it 
through their speech and their action. They themselves are privileged to one more level, the hey, the first hey, the thought. They can study Torah, learn Torah, and see within their minds that they have an expression of the divine soul. So this is a, the, a, a very simple uh, uh, correspondence of the four letters of God's name to the soul and its three garments. And this is true about any soul. It can be the divine soul, it can be the intellectual soul, it can be the animal soul, and so on. They all have the yud as the soul itself, the anima itself, or the power of the life itself, and then these three garments for, through which it, it's expressed. Going a little bit deeper, since we have a few, uh, two more minutes. So, when we perform an action, there are always two different levels to our action, meaning two different motivations. There's the higher motivation, which is concealed, and the lower motivation, which is revealed. What do we mean by the higher motivation? So here, Rav Ginsburg loves to bring a beautiful explanation of God's name, the th four-letter name, from Rabbi Avram Abu Lafi, who's usually considered to be the first Kabbalist, or one of the first. And he writes this amazing uh, acronym. He says, Yud Kei Vav Kei, these four letters of God's essential name, stand for Yetzer Atov Ve'yetzer Ara, the good inclination and the evil inclination. Now, when you hear this, you're suddenly you're taken aback. What do you mean? How could the final two letters of God's essential name correspond to the evil inclination? Well, the understanding of Hasidus is pretty simple. When our motivation is godly, it is concealed in the sense that that is the good inclination. The good inclination is actually concealed because we don't expect to see any reward coming from the action that we do. So we do a good action, we do a commandment, we perform a commandment, we do a mitzvah, and yet we don't uh, uh, expect to see the ramifications. So therefore it's the concealed. That is the good, the good inclination, Yetzer Atov. But when we do a mitzvah out of the evil inclination, it's called Yetzer Ara, but it's not evil at all. It's just the motivation is relatively speaking evil, there we want it to be revealed for us and for our offspring forever. In other words, if a person gives tzedakah, he gives charity, and he does it without any need for reward, he's doing it from his yetzer atov, it's concealed. The reward from it is concealed. He is not expecting to see it. But when he does it for ulterior motives, and the motive is that he wants the reward to be revealed, then he's doing it from vehaniglot, from the revealed aspect, which is for him and for his offspring. So these are two simple uh, explanations of looking at the concealed and the revealed, and how they align with these four letters of God's essential name. There are literally dozens more. Um, I actually wanted to teach a bigger one, which is actually well known, uh, hopefully at some other time. So, wishing everybody a good week, and hope to see you in the remainder of the days leading up to this Shabbos, and after that we have the last week of the year. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye.